served two tours as a U.S. military officer in Iraq and in Afghanistan. He's the author of the book, Only the Strong, Reversing the Left's Plot to Sabotage American Power. He is a U.S. senator from Arkansas and one of Israel's best friends on Capitol Hill, Senator Tom Cotton. Senator Cotton, thanks for making the time to uh, come on this show. Gary, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure. אנחנו רוצים קודם כל לפתוח בדיבור על היחידה, אותו מועדון של ערוץ טוב, שיאפשר לכולנו להיפגש. לא רק אנחנו איתכם, ולא רק המרואיינים המדהימים שלנו איתכם, אלא גם ביניכם לבין עצמכם, וליצור פה איזשהו דיאלוג שהוא בנוי על דיון מעמיק, שאלות, תשובות, ליבון, ומתוך כך נבנה ביחד עתיד הרבה הרבה יותר טוב. למדינת ישראל. ולכן זה מאוד חשוב שלא נישאר רק מאחורי המסכים, אנחנו כאן, אתם שם, להיכנס, להצטרף ליחידה, להצטרף למועדון הזה, זה מאוד מאוד חשוב. You just uh, emerged from a joint session of uh, the two houses of Congress where Netanyahu gave a speech. What is your impression? Well, this was the second time I've had a chance to hear the Prime Minister speak to Congress the first time uh, in 2015, and he gave yet another excellent speech that explained not just the shared interests of the United States and Israel, but our shared aspirations and values uh, that bind us so closely together, and why the American people stand so, so strongly with the people of Israel. Uh, they always have, and they especially do. over the last nine months of war since the October 7th atrocities. I thought he also did an outstanding job of noting that all these lunatics that are surrounding the Capitol protesting are in effect acting as useful idiots for Iran. Our intelligence services have reported publicly that Iran has been funding many of these protests, much like Soviet Russia or communist China has done in funding these kind of similar activities around the world. And just think, as he said, Um, how vacuous you have to be to be protesting on behalf of a terrorist group that raped women and killed children and burned families alive. So I thought it was a rousing speech. As always, it was a strong and articulate defense based on facts and logic, uh, something, frankly, we don't always hear in the United States Congress on a day-to-day -day basis. So I welcome the prime minister's speech, um, and I, I think it can only help to cement the bonds between our two nations even more. It, the, the Prime Minister spoke as if it was self-evident that everyone agrees that uh, Iran is our shared enemy and everyone agrees that Israel must win this war. Um, but but I, we in Israel, and I think, and I heard you speak about this, are sometimes doubtful whether this administration really understands the, uh, the situation in our region. Well, most Americans understand that Iran is a mortal sworn enemy of the United States. They don't need sophisticated, nuanced analysis to know that people who chant death to America and death to uh, Israel are not our friends. Um, now, the Democratic Party under Barack Obama and now Joe Biden has oftentimes either obscured those facts, stuck their head in the sand up uh, over it, or been extremely... naive or even ideological in the, in the belief that we can somehow cause Iran to change into a normal nation with normal grievances and rivalries that can be settled through negotiation and diplomacy, as opposed to confront Iran for what it is, a revolutionary state that wants to overturn the established order in the Middle East, and in particular, to drive the United States out of the Middle East. destroy Israel, and then establish itself as the regional hegemon. We can't allow that to happen. No matter what Joe Biden or Barack Obama or a handful of Democrats think, that's not what the American people believe. How, how was the, the attack the, that Israel uh, waged on Yemen in the aftermath of a drone that nearly hit the American consulate in Tel Aviv? How was that accepted? Because here we've been looking at the American-led coalition fighting the enormously dangerous, hugely uh, effective Houthis, and nothing happened. And then, and then Israel uh, struck the, uh, a port in, in, a, in a way that made the American attack so far look how, in, in, in your view? 
Well, Gabby, I, I have to say it probably hasn't gotten the attention it deserved to because just over the last few days um, in the aftermath of that attack, uh, we've been dealing here in America domestically with the attempted assassination of President Trump, the Republican National Convention with President Trump accepting the nomination, President Biden stepping aside and Vice President Harris uh, being substituted in through a coronation by the Democratic Party. Um, but I certainly took notice. Several Arkansans have raised it with me because although it was an attack in Tel Aviv, I think it's fair to say, based on the facts that we understand, as we understand them, that was an attempted attack on America. It only missed our consulate by a few hundred feet. It almost certainly was aimed at that consulate to kill Americans and to wreak havoc on what is officially U.S. soil under established diplomatic principles. So I'm very grateful that Israel took matters into its own hands to strike back hard against these outlaw rebels in Yemen. It's something that President Biden should have done a long time ago, not just because it threatens Israel or it threatens our partners in the region, but because it threatens the entire U.S.-led international order. One of the quickest ways to get into a shooting match with the United States historically is to obstruct freedom of navigations and commerce on the high seas or in the skies. That's exactly what these rebels in Yemen have been doing now for months. And I think the Ayatollahs in Iran, who are of course bankrolling them and arm rolling them, are simply shocked that President Biden has allowed them to reach out and put a stranglehold on the Red Sea and the Bab al-Mandab Straits through which something like uh, one twelfth of all global commerce passes. Um, that is a direct threat to the United States. We've had our U.S. Navy vessels in the area defending some of our ships, defending themselves, but frankly, not going on offense. The military here has briefed us on several occasions about how we've now had sailors in the so-called weapons engagement envelope for longer periods than at any time since World War II, as if that's something to celebrate. I've explained to them that what we should be doing is destroying the weapons that create the engagement envelope in the first place and not allowing these outlaws to continue to threaten our interests in the region. The, the policy in the Middle East is called by this administration regional integration. It's very hard to explain to Israelis the logic of, of, of that idea. Here, people buy the rhetoric that says that America is somehow organizing a coalition against Iran, but we don't see any direct threat to Iran. Iran attacked Israel directly. We're a, a close ally of America, and the United States exacted no price. What is the, the logic behind this? Uh, well, I have no idea what the administration means by regional integration. I think it's just a fancy uh, word for appeasement and conciliation of the Ayatollahs, which is what they've done from the very beginning not just Iran directly, but also its proxies. I mean, look at one of the first actions the administration took was to remove the terrorist designation on the Houthi rebels in Yemen uh, in the early days of the Biden administration that President Trump had slapped on them. They've continued to give Iran billions of dollars in sanctions relief. They haven't vigorously enforced sanctions against Iranian oil exports. They've put more pressure on Israel over the last month or over the last nine months than they've put on Hamas and put on Hamas's patrons in the region. This is a continuation of the Obama era policy, which I think was driven in large part by Barack Obama's deep ideological commitment that America is to blame for the tensions between Iran and the United States. Uh, of course that's wrong, but you can see how if that starts as your premise, it would lead you down the path, not only of a failed nuclear deal, but trying to totally reorder our security relationships in the region, which for a long time have been anchored with Israel, our great ally, along with several Arab nations, many of whom have now entered into peace agreements with Israel. What Iran wants to do is drive out the United States, destroy Israel, and then uh, reduce those Arab nations into subservient vassal states. The Biden administration has largely been aiding and abetting Iran in pursuing that policy. That's not the way it was under President Trump for four years. I don't think that's the way it's going to be under President Trump for the next four years either. The the uh, uh, most loud round of applause uh, in, in Netanyahu's speech was when he it, when he talked about the uh, useful idiots on American campuses, Peter, people even started chanting USA, USA. Was it, was were these the representatives and the senators chanting, or is that just come, come from the balconies? 
Well, from my perspective down on the House floor, it sounded like it was coming from us, the senators and the congressmen. Uh, but, you know, I think many in the galleries joined in as well. I, I would say that uh, one of the loudest rounds of applause to my ear on the House floor was for the very brave IDF soldiers who were there, some of whom had been wounded in the battles uh, from October 7th and onward. And we're very thankful that we had a chance to honor them and uh, to recognize their service and sacrifice on behalf of all of the great IDF soldiers who've been get going the extra mile for these last nine months to defeat the Hamas savages in Gaza. Um, the, the, the speech comes at a very, I would say, strange time in American politics. There's, just, there, there's been an attempt on a, 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 the, the other party's candidate, uh, an attempt on his life. Then there's Joe Biden stepping down. There's the disillusionment with the media. And then there is the, I don't know, appointment, should I say, of Kamala Harris. It's it's not exactly a, a nomination. And, and, and there was uh, much worry in Israel that the speech is not going to, to draw any uh, attention or worse, step on some mine. In, in a fraught moment in American politics. How, how will it play, in your opinion, on, on the background of what's happening? Oh, I think it'll uh, be very well received by the American people. I think only the most hardened anti-Zionist and, frankly, some anti-Semites would be critical of this speech. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu sounded exactly the right notes um, of solidarity between the United States and uh, Israel. Uh, thanking uh, the United States for everything we've done to help Israel, stressing that they're going to finish the job by destroying Hamas and bringing home every hostage that they can. Um, so I, I think the speech is very well received. You're right. It's at an unusual political moment, um, but uh, we're going to keep plowing ahead. You know, we now have, as you say, it wasn't exactly a nomination that Kamala Harris received, maybe a coronation from Democratic yeah. power brokers like Barack Obama and Nancy Pelosi and George Clooney. But she's apparently the nominee of the Democratic Party, and there's going to be a campaign now. I think one thing Kamala Harris is going to have to do is answer questions about exactly where she stands on Israel and Iran and the war against Hamas, because she hasn't done that for a long time. She ran for president once. She did very poorly. That was a campaign in the Democratic primary in 2019 focused primarily on domestic and economic issues. She has since been uh, you know, towing the Biden line for three and a half years. But if she wants the top job, she's going to have to answer these questions herself. And, and I suspect, frankly, that given uh, what I've heard from some on the inside, that she's not going to be a very good friend of Israel. I know that Donald Trump will be, though. What is the meaning of her absence, <clears throat> except for the, the fact that probably the sorority convention was extremely urgent? W w was that a wise move on, on her part from her perspective? from uh, from the the American perspective in general, it's a strange thing to do. Um, I agree. I mean, look, I, I'm sure that the audience to whom she was speaking in Indianapolis would have been disappointed that she couldn't uh, come speak to them. But Prime Minister Netanyahu's speech has been scheduled for some time. There's no question that they could have rearranged their schedule somewhat and she could have spoken to them uh, earlier in the day, later in the day at another time. I'm here to perform what is frankly one of the few constitutional responsibilities of the vice president. You know, the vice president oftentimes just hanging around the White House, advising the president, or maybe checking on the president's health as the old joke goes. But the vice president in our system also presides over the US Senate. Kamala Harris has done that on numerous occasions to break ties on Democrats' very controversial bills in the Senate. But they also sit in that chair during joint sessions of Congress, as you see, for instance, during the State of the Union. So it's disappointing that Kamala Harris didn't come perform her constitutional duty. I'll note that Joe Biden didn't do so in 2015 either. And for that matter, the senior Democratic senator, Patty Murray from Washington State, also declined to preside. Now, I'm not sure there's any precedent for the acting president of the Senate, the senior senator in the majority, to refuse to preside over a speech simply because they dislike the speaker's message. Um, unfortunately, it goes. It's it's a reflection too of the number of Democrats who boycotted this speech, and how the Democratic Party has drifted away from the traditional bipartisan support you see for Israel. Uh, I know that oftentimes those Democrats say like, "Well, we love Israel, we just can't stand Benjamin Netanyahu." Um, I, I would say that first, uh, Israel is a democracy; it has a right to choose its leaders and to choose its government. We shouldn't be intervening in those elections. We shouldn't be telling them they need to have new elections like Chuck Schumer recently did. Um, but second, a lot of those very same Democrats 
boycotted when President Herzog came to speak last year. Um, President Herzog obviously is a man of the center left in Israel, whereas Prime Minister Netanyahu is a man of the center right. If you're boycotting both Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Herzog, I don't think you have a Netanyahu problem. I think you have an Israel problem. Israel is somehow uh, has has become a divisive issue, and you know it's it, it, it's amazing how the Jewish questions is a is 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 a litmus test repeatedly in in Western culture. And if there are two paradigms, uh, if I may quote uh, Moshe Hess, the, uh, the the Jewish socialist who wrote a book called Rome and Jerusalem. So there's a universal idea of a unified culture, uh, Pax Romana or Pax Americana, under one system. And then there is the idea of particularism and, and self-determination. Um, and Israel seems to represent that idea most strongly. Would you agree that the division over Israel is also a division over globalism, over uh, patriotism in America, over wokeness, and uh, and over the uh, victim uh, glorifying culture. Well, unfortunately, you do have a, a very ideological left in America uh, and in Europe um, that has, frankly, host hostile anti-American, anti-Western views. In the United States and, and Israel, the two best exemplars of the uh, tradition of Western civilization, of constitutional representative government, of individual rights and the rule of law, of property rights, um, respect for the individual. Um, so therefore, they are, find themselves usually much more critical of the United States and Israel than they are of, say, Great Britain or France. Um, I would also note uh, that part of this is that the United States and Israel are the only two democracies in the world that use our military every single day. Yes, we have good, reliable military partners like Great Britain, but you obviously use your military every single day to defend your borders from terrorists or to chase down those terrorists when they breach those borders, as happened on October 7th last year. We use our military all around the world to maintain peace and stability for our benefit and the benefit of our allies and partners. And the fact that we use our militaries every single day is a daily living rebuke to all of the liberals around the world who fantasize that we'll someday have global governance of academics and judges and professors and journalists and non-governmental uh, organization activists, uh, because that's the way the world works. Um, so I think that's part of the reason why so many of these left-wing ideologues um, anathematize not only the United States, but Israel as well. Your personal relation uh, to to Israel, you you were a staunch supporter of Israel and a defender of of our interests. We'll speak in a minute about the bill you sponsored about uh, to to deal with the International Court of Justice at the Hague, at the Hague. I'm told you should say in, in English. We say Hague. Um, when did this um, uh, love of Israel start with you? So you know, I'll say, God, I, I did not grow up in one of these households. Uh, at first, we're not a political household. You know, we didn't talk politics. We didn't talk public policy, certainly not foreign policy as a child. Um, nor did I grow up, as so many um, you know Christians do, especially in the South, with a pastor who stressed um, that God has blessed Israel and those who bless Israel, uh, God will bless as well. Um, I did not have ministers that that kind of connected what we heard about in the Bible at Sunday school or during services to what was happening in the Holy Land today. Um, so I, I, when I left college or when I left high school for college, I, I really understood very little uh, about Israel or Middle Eastern politics. I mean, I understood, obviously, that Israel was the good guys and, and that its enemies was the bad guys. Um, but as luck would have it, I got to I got to college in my freshman year. I picked up a magazine uh, that had a lot of names on it that I recognized called Commentary. And I've been reading commentary now for, I guess, 29 years. And, you know, the views of Norman Podhoritz and now his son, John, but all the great writers in that magazine over the years have helped shape and inform my views from an early day. And then obviously, once I was in the military and serving in the region, that gave me a perspective from the ground. And over the last 12 years in Congress, I've been aided by several 
outstanding advisors and uh, assistants and aides and friends and mentors who keep me apprised on matters. Um, but I understand you know, not only personally um, the critical nature of our alliance with Israel, but also that's what the people of Arkansas expect from me. So I, I frequently get stopped you know, in airports and thanked for uh, for my support for Israel. And I tell them, I was like, well, you know, I'm grateful for that. And I, I would do it if it was just my own personal views, but you should know that it's not just me or primarily me. It's millions of Arkansans who are standing behind me as well. That's that's great to know. You were a conservative already as a student. You were on the board of the, the Harvard Crimson, which it looked at now. Harvard is become, has become a, a horrible place for for, for yeah, normal. Yeah, yeah. I wish you wouldn't have brought that up. I try to hide that part of my background. Now. People say, you know, what were you doing all those years in Massachusetts? And I tell them hard, hard time in a state penitentiary. And they're like, really? Because we, we heard you're at Harvard. It's like, nope, nope. I was definitely definitely in the state pen. But they, but they haven't state. managed to move your political, your basic political compass at all. No, no. I went, you know, by the time I was in high school, it was right after Bill Clinton had been elected president. And Bill Clinton was my governor for my, basically my entire life until then. Um, so that's, you know, I, I started getting interested in um, not just current events, but history and biography. Um, and although I wasn't raised in a political family, um, I was raised in a very conservative family in the apolitical sense. And that naturally led to conservative politics. So um, I guess the, the best way to come out of Harvard or any Ivy League college as a conservative is to go in as one. Um, and I certainly I didn't feel like I was an oppressed or beleaguered minority uh, at Harvard, nor did I think did many of my conservative peers. We knew we were a minority, but I would say that we were like a, a merry band of pirates who had boarded the good ship Harvard. I unfortunately don't think that's the case today. If you look at what's happening with all these anti-Semitic pro-Hamas mobs on campus and what I hear from my own young interns or new aides that are coming from campus directly, that conservatives and and unfortunately, in many cases, Jewish students do feel like they are an oppressed or beleaguered minority in college campuses. Not everywhere. And we should give credit where credit's due for campuses that protect the rights of all their students. But at places like Harvard and Columbia, unfortunately, the leadership there has failed their students. It's getting worse because when I, I did my Ph.D. at uh, Rutgers University, and that, that was a program in American history. And we were about 35 students in my class. And the only two people who were willing to say anything good about America, anything <clears throat> at all, were myself and a Japanese student who did diplomatic history. Americans, one after the other, just, just slammed America on everything. And it's been getting steadily worse since then. Is the, Your book be, traces this two ideas. And that's a rare thing in, in politics. Um, uh, politicians usually deal with the, the, the problems they face. But you start with the, with Hegel, with uh, Georg Friedrich Hegel. How does German yeah. idealism figure into what happened to the American? Well, world? yeah, un unfortunately, um, through the American progressive movement, much of German romantic philosophy was smuggled into American public life. You know, we're we're very fortunate in America that we were founded when we were, not you know, twenty or thirty years later after the French Revolution and the um, you know popularity of Rousseau and then Hegel as well. So our philosophical foundations were much sturdier here in America than they later became in Europe. Um, through much of the 19th century, statesmen obviously appealed uh, to the American founders and the principles of our founding documents, the Declaration and the Constitution and the Federalist Papers in particular. But Woodrow Wilson, uh, before he was pres elected president in 1912, was a college professor for 30 years. And college professors, I guess, weren't much better back then than they are now because he was the first American president to openly condemn and criticize the Declaration, the Constitution and our founding principles. Um, and he did that in large part, as many academics of age did, on the basis of what was here called progressivism, but is really just a, a politicized version of German romantic philosophy. This idea that there's history with a capital H that is naturally trending in some direction that we can only moderately shape and that it's going to reach the so-called end of history where we're all going to live together peacefully and in harmony. Uh, and that is largely influence Western or I'm sorry, uh, left wing ideas. Um, not only in Europe, but in the United States since then, um, as opposed to history as the kind, you know, what our founders thought or what the great historians of old like Herodotus or Thucydides would have said, which is that 
Um, history is shaped by the choices, choices uh, of individual men and women and of nations as a whole. And those choices can be reversed or those choices can be good or they can be bad. And uh, when you repudiate America's founding the way Wilson and the progressives did, it's not a very far step towards repudiating America itself. And that's what you got to by around the Vietnam War uh, is when the left really turned um, aggressively against America as a whole, not just our founding uh, principles, and uh, that's where they've been ever since. And uh, you know, the best, the the best embodiment we've had, maybe I should say the worst embodiment we've had of that uh, since that time is Barack Obama, who of course marinated in these left this left wing ideology going back to his early days. Yeah, he, he, the first Edward Saidian uh, president. I remember one of our. Uh, uh, most famous uh, social scientist, I can't uh, use his name because that was a, a, a private conversation. He said, look, this is not a president of America. This is a president of the third world. He's not representing uh, Americans. Would be would it be a, a, a good guess, Senator Cotton, to say that you are more a Madisonian than a Jeffersonian? Um, that might be fair. Um, I, I think James Madison, the father of our Constitution, um, understood what it took to preserve liberty and ordered government. Um, and that is, he wrote repeatedly in the Federalist um, that you have to have the precaution of elections, but you also have to have auxiliary precautions, things like the separation of powers and checks and balances and an independent judiciary, um, that these are things that um, allow for stable constitutional government that doesn't have wild swings uh, of policy based on shifting winds of transient public opinion, and that also protects the rights of the minority in a democracy. And uh, in countries that don't have those stable structures that are designed to protect governing institutions uh, to elevate public reason um, so that passions are not in charge or at the helm, as, as Madison wrote, um, I think has proven the test of time. Um, Jefferson obviously was a, a great man himself and the primary author of the uh, Declaration of Independence with its ringing uh, uh, endorsements of human liberty and equality. But I think as Lincoln put it, um, the Declaration is the apple of gold, but it needs to be uh, framed by the frame of silver of the Constitution that Madison helped put around it. Yeah, uh, be because America does oscillate between uh, realism and messianism. And, uh, and, and one thing that, that always struck me is if you look at, at the reasoning behind the Virginia law of religious freedom, then it, I'll, I'll sum it up really um, crudely. But there, there are arguments that Madison make, made and arguments that Jefferson made. And if you look at Jefferson, he basically said that God is liberal and therefore God decreed religious freedom, while Madison, Madison said, we don't know what God's intention is, and the magistrate is not the right authority to decide it. So I, I guess this was behind my question about your being a, a Madisonian. Um, am I dragging you too far? Yeah, I mean, I'd I say on, on questions like that, I always tend to favor what Abraham Lincoln's view was, which is, I, I don't know if God is on my side, but I certainly hope to be on God's side. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Middle Eastern uh, policy. Suppose tomorrow uh, there's a there's a Republican administration. Um, what should change? Well, we should say, as, as uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said today, that uh, quoting uh, or paraphrasing Winston Churchill, give them the tools faster so they can finish the jobs faster. Now, I hope that the war is over and Hamas is destroyed and all the hostages have been rescued by January 20th. But if not... Uh, then we need to provide Israel everything it needs to finish off Hamas. And, and the tragedy of Joe Biden's failed policy is that if we had simply done that from the beginning, if we had provided Israel with all the weapons it needed and all of the diplomatic and political support that it needed uh, from international criticism, this war would probably already be over. And the civilian suffering, which is caused solely by Hamas in Gaza, would be over as well. So I, I hope the war is over before January 20th. Um, but if it's not, then we need to quickly uh, back Israel to the hilt so we can end it. And is that the, the the limit? Because Netanyahu, in the beginning of the war, spoke as the war aims. They were limited to Gaza and Hamas. There were three. One is to, to uh, destroy Hamas's military and civil ruling uh, capabilities. The second was to return the hostages. The third was that Gaza would never pose a, a threat to Israel 
again. But well, I think that goes without saying. Once the once the threat has been eliminated, and I know Prime Minister Netanyahu and the government get some criticism about the so-called day after. Um, look, you know, we didn't worry about the day after when we went in and destroyed ISIS. Uh, you know, eight to ten years ago. Um, we knew that we had a mortal threat that was killing Americans and destabilizing our friends in the region. We had to end it. So uh, I'd say that right now we need to give Israel the time and space it needs to destroy Hamas and rescue the hostages. We can worry about what comes next after that happens or as it's concluding. But as the prime minister said today, the obvious solution is a demilitarized and de-radicalized Gaza, uh, just like we had a demilitarized and de-radicalized Japan and Germany after World War II. And and it seems like we're 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 going to face a war with uh, uh, Hezbollah, and basically we would have to take out the, we would have to take out the ring of fire, as Qasem Soleimani uh, called it, around us. There is a showdown ahead of us with Iran. Is that also a case of give us the tools and we'll finish the job, or or does America have a different role in this war as 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 a, the Prime Minister defined it so? Clearly, the war of civilization against barbarism, uh, where the front is in the Middle East. Well, I, I wouldn't want to take as granted any additional wars. Uh, obviously, we need to take steps to help Israel neutralize the threat that Hezbollah poses to it. Um, but, you know, I, I would just note that we didn't have this kind of war and instability in the region under President Trump. Um, we had peace and stability and the status quo by and large. Um, yes. Uh, there were interventions such as the two airstrikes against Bashar al-Assad's regime for gassing his own people, and most importantly, um, the killing of Qasem Soleimani, Iran's terrorist mastermind. But we didn't have anything on the scale that you're facing today from Hamas and Hezbollah and the Houthi rebels in Yemen. Um, I wouldn't take it as given that our enemies are going to act the same with President Trump back in the office they act with Joe Biden, because they know that Joe Biden's national instinct, along with many in his party, is to put pressure on Israel, not to put pressure on them. But I, I would just point all, all of your audience to President Trump's convention speech last week. You know, most of that speech was a contrast between his record and Joe Biden's record. Um, and he's able to do that because of the very unusual circumstances of this campaign. For the first time in more than 100 years, we have two presidents running against each other. So one candidate doesn't have to promise what he would do or make campaign pledges. He just points to what he did. One of the few things that Donald Trump predicted he would do in a second campaign, though, or in a second term, though, um, is in your neck of the woods. He said, we want our hostages back and they better be back before I become president or you're going to pay a very big price. And I think that was a very important message to Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran that it won't be the like it's been for the last four years if uh, Donald Trump takes office. And that's not just about the hostages that we want back. It's about the threat that Iran and all of its proxies pose as well. Senator, last question. There, there, There is a bill that you sponsored along with, I think, uh, Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Ted Cruz uh, that would sanction the uh, personally the, the, the judges in the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, where does where does that stand currently? Well, let's just say that in Donald or in uh, in Chuck Schumer's Senate, it may not go very far. I mean, this is the man remember who called for new elections in Israel, as yeah. if you're some you know third world client state that we get to call the tune to. And fr frankly, I think we should have new elections in New York, for Chuck Schumer's seat, but. Um, Several of these bills I've introduced, uh, although we can't expect them to probably go very far in Chuck Schumer's Senate. I, I do think they can kind of lay out a, a game plan for a Trump administration, since the president has a much freer hand in foreign policy than he does in domestic policy. For instance, the sanctions against the International Criminal Criminal Court um, in The Hague or The Hog or however you pronounce it. Maybe we can just call it the Kangaroo Court and be done with the foreign pronunciations. I, I um, that that. That law is necessitated because Joe Biden reversed Donald Trump's sanctions uh, against court officials for investigating American service members in Afghanistan. And he can do that again uh, for what they've targeted against Prime Minister Netanyahu and other Israeli officials. So although it may not go very far in Chuck Schumer's Senate, uh, I think you would see it as something of a preview of what we do with a new and much better president. Senator Tom Cotton, thank you so much for making the time to speak with us right after Netanyahu's speech. Thank you, Gary. Great to be on with you. Thank you.